Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ninth episode of Pro Music is Family of Artists. I'm delighted to welcome the 1976 Pro Music is International Award winner in cello, Sharon Robinson. Sharon Robinson is one of the leading American cellists today. She has had an unbelievable career as a soloist, as a chamber musician, as a teacher. She and her husband, Jamie Laredo, have gone on to form a wonderful trio with the great pianist Joseph Kallestein. They have premiered works by Andre Previn. They've played with all the major orchestras, and it's just an incredible career, and we're so lucky to have her as a member of the Pro Musicus family. Welcome uh, to Pro Musicus family of artists, Sharon. Well, thank you. I feel like um, I'm from so long ago. Thank you for noticing. Me well, you're at the very at the very beginning of one of the very first ones, and that's a that was a very special time in the in the uh, history of Pro Musicus. And I know you have a very wonderful story to tell about how you got connected to Pro Musicus. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about where you were from, uh, where you were born, who about a little bit about your early teachers, um, and just a little bit about your background. And that's what led you up to pro music is all in about two minutes or less. I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. Let me I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. Nope. Well, I was, born, I was born in Houston, Texas. My parents yeah. were in the Houston Symphony. So okay. I, I have musician parents. They were not from Texas. They were from Maine and New York. They went to Eastman uh -huh. and Curtis. So uh, they were not real Texans, but they raised their, all their whole family there. All my siblings are also fantastic musicians, really. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's a very rich family nice. I, I come from. Anyway, I had some wonderful early teachers in Texas. Um, the first cellist of the Houston Symphony, Shirley Treppel, Marion Davies. These were all Piotr Gorski assistants. And I had some wonderful uh, you know, mentors and very inspiring women in my life, including my mom. Um, anyway, I went to University of Southern California. I also, for two years, then I transferred to Peabody. I finished up there. And that's where I met my mentor, Leon Fleischer. And uh, he, he remains every day I, when I'm playing or whatever, when I'm practicing, when I'm teaching, I'm thinking of Leon an awful lot because I love that man. And I got to, I got to uh, be very, I got to do a lot of stuff with him. My, my first Beethoven triple, my first Brahms double. Uh, wow. I, got, I played in his Annapolis Symphony Orchestra so he, uh, when I was at Peabody. So I got to ride out there two hours back and forth uh, talked politics, talked life. That was when he was struggling with his hand. So I uh, I learned a lot from him about adversity and how to over overcome it. Anyway, then uh, I met Jamie and moved to New York. And that's the year, that very first year, uh, I uh, was in an orchestra that was conducted by Pierre Boulez. And he, um, he recognized my talent and he came to Father Merlet and he said, you know, this would be somebody worth sponsoring. So there was no competition. There was no choosing. Wow. It was just Pierre Boulez says, how about, how about this young cellist? And I, I was thrilled <laughs> uh, beyond belief and uh, got to know Father Merle very, very well. Um, he was the one that came to all my early community concerts in prisons and, and San Quentin and the, the Houston, Texas, uh, the, the women's jail, the women's jail in New York. Uh, I, I got to play for a lot of people that really were so hungry for music. And that's what Pro Music Jeez gave me more than anything. And you, and you have said on the record that uh, doing those kind of community concerts with, uh, with Father Merlet uh, kind of laid the groundwork for, for, your, for your life, for your attitudes toward performing in music. It was, mm -hmm. it was these experiences that were so important to you. They absolutely, absolutely were. They taught me that it's not just who can play faster and better and louder, but who can really reach out and uh, touch people. And uh, I think that really, uh, really touched a, um, a chord in me. And I have always wanted music to be more communicative as I have I have, I have uh, toured with my trio, as I've played concertos with orchestras, uh, everything is, that's the most important uh, facet. And I, I pass that along to my students too. Wonderful. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you, went, you, you talk about specifically playing at the Phoenix House, I believe, that was one of your first 
uh, community service concerts. There was a, a feature article, I believe, in your, uh, at the time in the Boston Globe that John Haig shared with me, which is a beautiful article about pro music and yourself and how you got involved with it and playing at the, at the Phoenix House. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, more memorable you cannot find. I mean, there, these people were struggling and really institutionalized before they came to Phoenix House and so hungry for any kind of uh, art, any kind of music, any kind of less uh, not non-medical sort of experience. And it, Absolutely. Was, it, was, it was my honor to get to play for them. Nice. Now, can you, can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with Father Merlet? Uh, you said that you got to be very close with him. He was such a gem. He was such an incredible spirit. He just had a very special aura about him, don't you think? Well, he spoke very, very softly. So, and he had this wonderful French accent. But you always had to kind of lean in and listen to him very carefully because he just spoke. He spoke from his heart, but it was very unforced and never, never calling attention to himself. That's for sure. Never. Just um, a very, ge very gentle, passionate, religious, elegant, committed, loving man. Absolutely, and it certainly one of the most wonderful souls I have ever gotten to meet. Um, Absolutely, we're so we're so lucky that that he touched our lives, you know. And look, yeah. you're, we're going you're going back to 1976 when you first met him, and here mm -hmm. we are in 2021, all these decades later, and 45. we're talking about we're, and you're talking about him with the warmth and love like when you first encountered him all those decades ago, which is which is is it says everything. He, he was with me when, when Jamie and I played at San Quentin in San Francisco, uh, and he was with me in, in Paris, he was with me in Boston and New York. Uh, nice. I don't think there were a tremendous amount of... Um, Concerts that you gave that didn't come. All over the... Yes, there are now, but I was so, so uh, thrilled to get to do the ones I did, and they really Had, helped my career a, a lot. Did you... um? Was your New York debut under the auspices of Pro Musicus at the time, or? Yes, because then after that, I got the Avery Fisher Award and I got to do a one at at, 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 at Alice Tully Hall. At but Alice Tully. First, yes, but my first recitals were with uh, with Pro Musicus, and I played in all sorts of interesting places. Um, and you know they they were able to they were struggling always financially, especially in the early days. But they were always able to get very interesting um, audiences, and maybe a lot of people that didn't go to the normal the New York debut. Right. So uh, I, I was able to reach people that that stayed with me for for all my recitals subsequently. And and we were we're, we're so blessed also in the Pro Music is, uh, uh, organization in that uh, John Haig has kind of taken the torch. And he is a, he is a soul like like no other uh, like Father Merlet, uh, his, and he is literally he liter he's literally given his he has given his soul and his energy to this organization because I can tell you one thing it's not about the money it's oh, a, it's, it's about it's about it's about dedication and about love and about making a difference and that's what music is all about in the first place absolutely and, uh, and it's it's just a very you know I feel that you know although there's a, a nice family of artists through the through the decades of pro, and we don't all know each other we're meeting for the first time right now the two of us but we all we are all connected to this to pro musicus and it helped us form our attitudes of how we feel not only about music but about life absolutely and how we should lead our lives and how we should share our lives with with Amen. Our students and and other people. Beautiful. Know, it's, I, I so I so agree. And and Pro Musicus was the perfect example of that. And you know, it, and and Father Merlet's mission was not always. He didn't see it as being like a competition, if you will. He wanted to make it like an award. You were given an award. It wasn't. It, there was no first place, second place, third place. If if they wanted to give out three awards, they'd give out three awards. If they didn't want to give, you know, it was like that. And uh, I think that was a very important mission for Father Merlet to not make it like this, this formal kind of competition, if you will. And uh, that kind of made it stand out as well, um, which I thought was really, was really wonderful. Now, 
when you you said earlier before you had met Pierre Boulez and uh, and gone on to uh, be a protege of, of Father Merlet and start pro, in pro music in 1976. You said that you had attended USC as, yes. as, a, as a student. Now, did you mm-hmm. study with Piatigorsky? No, I was with uh, Gabi Raito. And oh, then sure. He, and he went on sabbatical, and then I had Larry Lester, and that's when I decided to follow Larry Lester to Peabody. After I that. see, I see. So who would but, you say, okay, so who would you say specifically... I know you've talked about Mr. Fleischer, the, the great master, and how it basically like became like a part of your family, actually, is the way you're taught, and, and his, his influence and his inspiration, of course, um, and how fortunate you were to be in his inner circle like that. was so fortunate to, to learn from him in that, in that environment. It's, it's very special. Um, who are your inspirations besides Mr. Fleischer? Uh, as a cellist wise, cello wise. Cello wise, well, my, my last and my major teacher was Larry Lesser, who is still playing beautifully uh, at his age now. And um, he, he really taught me how to teach myself, which is a great gift. He, he taught me how to listen and how to really um, be very discerning and not take uh, no for an answer when my body didn't want to do it or when my ears weren't weren't as uh, honed as they should be and so he really he really taught me a tremendous tremendous amount and it stays with me all the time i find myself saying things that he said to me to my students so um, yeah i I admire i continue to admire larry lesser a great deal he teaches now at um new england conservatory he was i i studied with him at peabody but he's how old a man how old a man is he i believe he's 81. well so he's he's got he's young it's young these days now Mm -hmm. you know i've also studied i i've studied some of the footage of Mr. Laredo, like when he won the, there's there's some newsreel footage of when he won the Queen Elizabeth competition, mm-hmm. and you can see and you can see him as a young man getting the award from Queen Elizabeth and and, and all this kind of thing. So what 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 I'm going to ask you now is, uh, in your marriage and in your relationship, have you learned a lot from playing with with your husband? Um, Absolutely. Be- I mean, I I have to say this is the biggest gift I could have given myself <laughs> in my life is to have married Jamie and get to play all this repertoire with him. We've, we've expanded the double concerto repertoire by exponentially by 10, I think. And fantastic. We have, we have, we've played, we've commissioned duos together. We have played, of course, a lot of trios with Joseph Kalichstein. We uh, play quintets and sextets and septets. Jamie is a great, great musician and I've I got to you know rub elbows with him all. Now, do you years. do you, so? Do you uh, has the personal aspect ever interfered with the professional aspect? Like when you're in rehearsal, for instance, and you don't agree with him, do you get do you sometimes get into disagreements musically, or how does that work? Absolutely, I, I'm a very outsp- outspoken person, and uh, I think our motto in our trio is to just say what you want. And then you know worry about how people are going to feel afterwards because none of us really take it personally. That's the thing. Right. It's because 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 ultimately, it's about the music and Absolutely. making the music better. That's it's not about us. It's not about Jamie. It's not it's not about Mr. Rolando. It's not about Miss Robinson. It's about the music. Right. And that's right. that. And that's what. And that's and being passionate and outspoken shows that you care about it and you want you're passionate about it. And uh, that's that's a good thing in my in my eye. It, it's been fantastic. I think, you know, as long as um, I will say that whatever musical disagreements or whatever disagreements we have, is, we can always compartmentalize and go on and have, go home and have a nice dinner or, absolutely, uh, yeah. go, you know, go, go out and have a swim and, and just be friends. Nice. He, he's really my best friend. Nice. Sure. Now, now what, tell us uh, what kind of cello do you play and when did you get it? And tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I uh, I play a seventeen seventeen Stradivarius, which oh. Jamie bought for me um, by selling his Stradivarius, and he traded in his Stradivarius for an Amati and a Montagnana and my cello, my Strad. 
So oh, that's true. That's true love, Sharon. It, and and we still miss his violin. I have to say that violin was unbelievable. But he just he just felt that he wanted me to have the experience of having a great 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 cello, and that was the way he figured out to isn't do that it. One, isn't that wonderful? And that now, was about ten years. Yeah. No, let me see. It was about twelve or thirteen years ago. So really, not that long, not that long ago, really. Recently. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Now I saw recently. Uh, well, before obviously he passed away, but. You commissioned a double concerto. I mean, it's amazing how you guys have expanded the repertoire. That's just amazing in itself, the double concerto repertoire. Um, but I saw that you commissioned Andre Previn to write a double concerto, yes? He wrote uh, a beautiful, beautiful double concerto. Can, can you tell us about, I mean, I love Andre Previn. Love so much in the American popular song. I mean, Previn was such an important part of that world. And I mean, he had, he had his foot in both worlds. I mean, imagine uh, he was going to Beverly Hills High School as a junior and senior and going to MGM and working with Arthur Freed and all of the great Johnny Green and all these people doing orchestration and music directing after he was done at Beverly Hills High School. And then goes on to become this great, great musician of, of the world. I mean, I, I just I just love, I love what he was about. And uh, could you talk a little bit about how the Double Concerto came into uh, existence and where you premiered it? Absolutely. We, um, first he wrote us a trio. We asked him to write us a trio. and. Uh, turned out to be a wonderful piece. And when we were premiering that, that was the New York premiere was at Tully Hall at, mm -hmm. for Chamber of Society. And we mm -hmm. were out in, you know, for a little reception out in the hallway there uh, in the atrium. And he was kind of sitting over there all by himself. And we went over and started talking to him. And he, he brought up, he said, hey, I see that you guys have, have commissioned a lot of double concertos. And I said, Yes, and we've been hoping that we could ask you to write us one. And he said, of course, I'd love to. <laughs> it was as easy as that. Um, wow. And, where, and yeah. where, did you, where did you premiere it? The premiere was with the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. And we played it. There was a whole consortium of orchestras that, uh, Participated, that we Participated, yes. Um, wow. And that's been one of my... So one of my specialties in life is, is getting these consortiums together. Right now I'm, I'm um, busy with get, getting, I think I have 13 presenters for a new piece by a wonderful black composer, Tula Nguyenyama. She's writing us a piano quartet when she's going to play and, and, and we're going to pre premiere that next April in Cincinnati also. Um, but I, getting back to Andre, he would just spent hours and hours talking about the good old days at MGM and all the people he got to work with oh, and all, my funny God. stories. I, I mean you listen you listen you listen to that gorgeous, gorgeous Warner Brothers orchestra playing that My Fair Lady that he did. I mean it's just it the string it, writing and it's just so I, so lush and so I didn't beautiful. Watch that. Just an amazing, amazing I mean when when listen. at the at the at the end of the film when Rex Harrison comes into the that gorgeous apartment and the strings just kind of soar and it's it's just it's just so lush and so beautiful i had the i had the opportunity of spending time and becoming friendly with Ephraim Zimbalis Jr at the end of his life and oh. um, and he and we were talking about andre as well and we were talk he said he he used to he was working on the fbi and he'd go into the sound stage there and, and and he watched the movie and we talked about that specific moment of those glorious strings just soaring at the at the end of the film it's just and, and all the you know when he and he wrote this incredible song that gene kelly sang when he was dancing on roller skates and it's it's always fair weather um mm -hmm. he wrote the, he, I mean, he did everything and it's so so wonderful that you were able to to become friends with him and and utilize his brilliance as a composer and have these special pieces to bring them that will keep his legacy living on and that's that's we were very what it, fortunate. that's what it's all about. That's what it's we all miss, about, and we really miss him now. He's he was such yeah. a a great pal and a great presence in our life. Oh, it's wonderful. You you you've uh, you know your life. That's well. That's the question I wanted to ask you. Also, is can you give us a little bit of insight into your world and to your thoughts about? We don't have to get political here because that's a whole other thing. But about <laughs> what this what this what this year has brought to you and what you've learned and what you've taken away artistically and what just your thoughts on, on, on this horrific year. This pandemic, uh, it's been 
in some ways the most horrible year of my life. In some ways it's been one of the best. One thing that it's really taught me is that I never want to be that busy again, ever. I was so, so busy. So you're, you're going to modify, you're going to modify your performance schedule in the future? Absolutely. I'm never going to say yes that many times in a row. No, that's uh, something. I, uh, and that's a big, it's going to be a big change. And I'm 71 now, so it's just a good time to, to start thinking about, you know, it's the best, best years of best years of your life, Sherry. Well, I, I hope so. I'm, I'm healthy I'm, and, and I'm, Jamie's healthy. Yes. So we're, we're and having- see, And it's also wonderful that you're best friends with Jamie. So you yeah. could shelter and you can shelter in place with your best friend and you're, you're ble- and you're blessed and you're blessed with, you know, you've had this long career of teaching and performing and Jamie the same. And you've, you've, you know, you've done this your whole life and accumulated uh, to be able to be to be able to ride this out, if you will. And that's a that's a very, you know, very fortunate, but only through only it, it, it just didn't happen overnight. This is years of of dedication and working so hard. I mean, literally, literally. And I don't think the the, the audience really knows who are not musicians really understand the blood that we sweat to bring music to people. Um, There's some discipline and and hard work that goes into it, but I will say that what has also saved me during this year is my teaching. CIM made it possible for us to teach in person since last August, that's a year ago now. And- uh, And how how did that work, Sharon? It was was amazing. They they upped the um, ventilation system, so it's hospital grade. They made these, um, plexiglass uh, uh, on roller, the, these little panels that we could put between us and, and the student. So we could teach one-on-one or I could teach my trios. Um, and I felt safe. I had the window open all year, including December, January. I had a air purifier going. I mean, we were all masked, but I felt safe. My students are so dedicated and they, they've they worked so hard to get where they are that they were, were not about to jeopardize anything by going out and being stupid. Of course not. So did you see, <clears throat> did you see, interestingly enough with your students this year, working with them like that, did you see more of a growth in them than maybe ordinarily you would have seen, it Absolutely. being that the, the world was normal? Absolutely, everyone ha- was so focused on, you know, their growth and and making making use of this unusual Time. year and uh ha- there were not so many distractions really you know they no. they had they had their school life their cello their you know their music and and they all made tremendous strides which is great as a teacher to see and how, how many students do you teach at cim i have six cellists and three trios so that, that that's I, that's a lot but but it, it's not that's that's very doable you can really give of your time to that to those six students instead of yes. 15 or 20 students whatever it is Absolutely. that's that's really yeah. nice and a person of your a person of your stature uh to take it, that's that's really an ideal situation it's really great uh, it is it's it's, i mean i've got to work with some of the greatest musicians in the world um you've you know, been touched you've been touched by the yeah. greatest it's so, it's amazing you've had such a you you have had and are having and are having i keep it in the present and the future uh I hope so. such, such <laughs> of course uh, such a such a rich life, and it's so it's nice. So pass that on. You know? Pass that on, and it's so wonderful that we can sit here and talk and reminisce when you were so young and getting started, and we can sit here and talk about pro musicus and Father Merlet and how that's still so very important to you. It's so it's so nice it, to it, hear. It is so important, and there was one other um, thing that that pro musicus has has given me, and that is. Um, really wanting my students and me to keep on doing community concerts. Now, um, Kim Kashkashian, she is one of the pro music cheese artists and um, yes, she, started, she started Music for Food. And now I'm the director of the um, Cleveland chapter of Music for Food. And mm-hmm. every year with my students, uh, sometimes it's more than one, but every year at least one concert, we raise a lot of money for the local food banks and um, we have a, a, a very special, the Kosher Food Bank in, uh, in Cleveland that is very small and it's totally volunteer and every dollar raised goes, goes to feed the food challenged and there's such, such a need now, gosh. Yeah, such a need. Such More a than need. ever. 
Absolutely, and we and we need we need more than ever. Like you, we need beauty. We need we need love. We need beauty in the world. We need it. We always need it. But now more than ever, it's the it's the antidote to the evil that is lurking, is 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 the beauty. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's very interesting. Um, you know, what I've discovered in my career because I used to have, and I still do, and I'm sure because we're human beings, uh, stage fright. Um, you still get the butterflies or whatever it is, okay. right? Yeah, absolutely, it's normal. But I've always told myself, and I'm sure you agree, and I'm sure you've come to the same discovery, is that I talk to myself and I say, and this applies, I think, to, to just life in general, that the love of a lifetime will always win over the fear of the moment. Mm, the fear of the true. moment is not as strong it can never win over the love of a lifetime. Very true. And that con and that that calms me down, if you will, because he realizes that we're human beings and that how strong the emotion of love really is, and uh, and how pow and how powerful it is, and how power. I mean, we we experience it. We experience it. I mean, and plus, I mean, you play an instrument that is next to your body that is so. I mean, you feel the vibrations. It's a very it's 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 different. It, it's it's very different, uh, kind of. I, I can't imagine, but it's it's very special. And the beautiful sound of the cello. Oh my goodness gracious! It's so it's so beautiful. It's when you hear this great literature and you, somebody's beautiful, a great artist like yourself playing playing these things. Now we're very lucky. Very lucky indeed. I, I wanted to ask you, what instruments did your parents play in the Houston Symphony? My dad was a bass player and my mom a violinist, and I was the oldest of the five kids, so I got to, to be the compromise kid with a cello. And there was a, you know, as I mentioned, a great first cellist. I heard her playing the swan out in the park, the oh, summer park concerts. And I just said, that's, that's what I want, because I was playing piano a little bit, but not so well. And I decided the cello would be my voice, and it, it's stuck with me ever since. Well, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, I'm looking at a quote right now that the Indianapolis Star made about you. And they said, um, a cellist who has simply been given the soul of Caruso. Now, how, how much, how, how beautiful is that? The soul of Caruso. It's just I didn't incredible. even pay that person to say that, but my God, that's a great quote. It's beautiful. Quote. It's a wonderful yeah. quote. Now, now I, I do this with all the artists that I'm interviewing, the pro music as artists. So I'm going to ask you two things. The, the first thing that I will ask you is, I want, I'd like you to share a performance that's on video, preferably, of not yourself, but an artist, it doesn't have to be cello either, uh, that, that you just love, that has inspired you, that you think is so incredible, so that we can show that. Is there something that comes to mind that you could you know, suggest? Anything by Leon Fleischer.
being associated with him so closely and listening to him and his recordings, he he teaches he taught you how to sing through the cello yeah. and how, how how to how to sing how to approach a phrase. I mean that that's that's universal. That's not just from instrument to instrument. That's that's musician stuff that goes yeah. down the line. From well, I mean when I was when I was at Peabody, he had some marvelous piano students, really marvelous. And I oh my play. God, yes. God, yes. I got to play a lot of chamber music and uh, the whole sonata repertoire with them. And he, he had a bad back at that time and he would lie on the floor of his studio and his sc score above him and you know say no no you have to you have to feel that differently what what are you going for there he was always asking questions in his in his teaching which i wish i could do more of in my teaching i instead of suggesting things maybe just ask ask people now i'm going to ask you also that we now that we're we've seen uh this video of fleischer which is you know anything that it's just so inspiring uh if you could share with us a performance of yourself that stands out for you that you really think is extra special repertoire wise uh performance wise that night whatever it is so that we can show the audience there's a video of me playing the um rachmaninoff cello sonata cello and piano sonata with antonio pampabaldi oh he's a wonderful pianist isn't he a wonderful pianist fabulous and a wonderful musician
just in closing, I want to say, you know, what a what a joy it was to get to know you and hear your thoughts, hear about your career. But I don't even like the word career, but your life as a musician and your wonderful, beautiful collaboration with your beloved husband, Jamie, and your start with music and pro musicus and share these performances and your thoughts. Um, you're an inspiration to us. And I, I thank you for taking the time to participate in pro musicus family of artists. Oh, my pleasure. And please go on and do all the rest of the profile. This is such an interesting series that you're doing. And I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck and, and, and thank you so much again. Thanks. Bye-bye.